Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the PI3 kinase uh, pathway inhibitors and, uh, and try to make up a little time uh, here as well and uh, start with some disclosures. Um, so I think it's important when we think about PI3 kinase to really understand what it is that we're talking about. And it's, um, it's the, the, the simple way that uh, I like to think about this is it's really a, uh, a way to sense the environment. And normal cells use this to try to understand whether the environment is uh, conducive to growth. And remember that to grow, you have to have enough energy, have to have enough building blocks, and you have to have a signal from the environment. And so this, you can really think about this as a pathway that normally, when it's acting appropriately, integrates these uh, and uh, results in, uh, in tumor uh, signaling for tumor growth. Now, that blue box that, uh, on that last slide is a, uh, obviously simplistic, as uh, admittedly is even this complex slide for, the, for, the com for how these interact. And there's a really a variety of, uh, of downstream components. And a lot of these have been then used uh, to try to uh, interrogate and in inhibit uh, tumor growth. So, uh, you know, one way to look at this is to think about this as a signaling that comes from the cell surface, these growth factor receptors, signaling uh, through uh, PI3 kinase um, activation, remembering that there's an, in, uh, an inhibitor, P10, phosphatase, that uh, reverses some of the effects of PI3 kinase, uh, and then signaling through AKT and mTOR inhibitor. So the, the, uh, I think it is important to recognize that these pathways, although we like to make them nice and linear, do diverge, and there's lots of uh, these side branches that may indeed be very uh, clinically relevant. Now, how often is this dysregulated? How often does this very nice uh, sensing AND gate in the uh, normal cells get uh, dysregulated in cancer? And I highlight uh, some data from uh, TCGA where we have it and some uh, data on epigenetic uh, loss that's always a little harder to, to uh, quantify. Uh, but you can see that there are indeed uh, uh, mutations uh, present in uh, colorectal cancer and gastric cancer. Again, these are throughout the, entire, the entirety of the gene, uh, not necessarily just the, the hotspot mutations that we're used to thinking about, uh, but also events and amplification uh, that, uh, that can play a role as well. So there's certainly uh, evidence in some settings that, that this is relevant. Variety of inhibitors uh, that have been developed to these uh, various uh, uh, points. I'd say we should think about this primarily as PI3 kinase inhibitors. There's also AKT inhibitors and, and uh, slightly downstream mTOR uh, inhibitors. And of course, these all come in a variety of flavors with different specificity for different isoforms uh, or uh, genes in the family. And obviously, I can't cover everything because there are over 50 agents uh, in development. Uh, in various classes of, uh, of therapies and then treatment strategies, either monotherapy uh, uh, more prominently, but also uh, now increasingly in combination uh, with various agents. So a very uh, a large number of, of agents being studied and uh, GI. So before I uh, delve into the not-so-bright spots, I'll start with the good news that, you know, in, uh, in neuroendocrine tumor, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, mTOR inhibition, uh, clearly can play a role. Uh, some nice studies there uh, demonstrating the role of uh, emerylimus, uh, and uh, I highlight uh, one New England Journal paper from James Yao uh, here as an example. But uh, that is uh, the, not the, the rule for GI cancers. And when we look at single agent activities uh, for a variety of uh, unselected patients, uh, there really weren't any uh, responses in GI tumors in phase one, right? So when you have a huge number of patients looking for clear uh, signals, uh, there's just no, no reproducible signal as a single agent. Now, does this mean the pathway is not important? Um, there is in selected patients, there have been some studies suggesting uh, uh, perhaps a hint. Uh, there was one colorectal cancer patient that responded to a PI3 kinase uh, mute, uh, inhibitor. Uh, they expanded that further with another 67 and couldn't replicate it. Uh, so hard to understand there. Um, no correlation with uh, the mutations and response to PI3 kinase or AKT in, uh, inhibitors. Uh, Josef had a nice uh, uh, summary of uh, his group's experience with this 
uh, combination and really saying that it's, it's not quite as simple as have mutation, give single agent inhibitor, and, and expecting uh, dramatic uh, responses. So the question, of course, is why? Um, and I'll end by saying that, you know, that uh, the data that we have suggests that we, even though there's been lots of agents that have been developed for a lot of these agents, we don't always know are we completely inhibiting the pathway, right? Pharmacodynamics are hard. Uh, there's a lot of feedback that goes on, as, uh, as you heard, the discussion of the MAP kinase pathway. Um, it's given the multiple agents, it's unlikely it's just a PK issue, right? It may, it's, uh, there's enough variability there. But the question is, is this something that we need, you know, high degree of inhibition? Will partial inhibition be sufficient? Uh, and that brings up issues of therapeutic window. And one of the common themes, and you heard very elegantly in the MAP kinase uh, stories, this idea that when you inhibit a node, you, the cells respond, they adapt, uh, feedback occurs, uh, and that's uh, a critical component of, of uh, much of the cell signaling. Um, and so what are the critical factors that get upregulated uh, that may rescue cells from PI3 kinase inhibition? Are we just not selecting patients uh, appropriately? And there's some uh, intriguing data suggesting that perhaps we need to look at particular molecular subtypes and particular isoforms. So a lot of effort going on, for example, of P10 loss that may be associated with the PI3 kinase beta uh, isoform. Or these randomized phase two studies that are ongoing, maybe it is that we need this, the cytotoxics, that we won't uncover the efficacy of the, the inhibitors uh, unless we have a concurrent uh, cytotoxic push. So I would say that, that it's clear that these aren't home runs. We're not seeing single agent activity in selected patients. Uh, and there's still a lot of work uh, that we have to do despite the, uh, the almost 1,000 patients uh, that we've uh, treated uh, with these inhibitors and, and even more at this point. Uh, and and some, these are some of the key questions uh, for the field to consider. So I'll end there. <laughs>